I'm Stephanie, I'm the project officer for CITIZEN, which is pretty acronym horrific. It is Coastal and Intertidal Zone Archaeological Network. Uh, so basically, we look at things that are covered with water at high tide and exposed at low tide on the beach, which is pretty great. Um, and we work uh, along, around England. Um, this is Megan, who is in the conference later. See if you can find her later. She's inside of a brick kiln, or a, a lime kiln, rather, on the coast. And this is our volunteer, John, recording it with our app, which is what we're going to talk to you today. Um, I should just have a look at our um, logo. We've got Logo Bingo with all of our project supporters <laughs> and so forth, and we, we greatly appreciate all of them. <laughs> so, let's move along. So why did we start um, looking at coastal archaeology and intertidal archaeology? Well, because we've had um, a lot of increasing ferocity of winter storms, storm surges, um, managed realignments, <coughs> and so forth. So kind of allowing seawalls to breach, as you can see in the lower photo here. Um, and that all sort of affects the heritage along the coast. Um, and as it goes with England, um, you don't really get much statutory protection other than sort of protected wrecks and so forth along the coast. And so we're looking for another way to record them, uh, sort of preservation by record. Um, we're not going to go and pour concrete over everything and save everything. <laughs> so we want to see what's out there uh, before it disappears. So Citizen is sort of created as a direct response to those threats on the archaeology here. Bosh, so our, our heritage is washing away or shearing off of cliffs, as in the top photo. <laughs> so um, I would not want to be those people right next to that wall at Berlin <coughs> Gap. So please mind yourselves if you're walking along the South Downs coast path in the future. Um, but we are a response uh, to those threats, as I said before. Um, we are working in areas that are only exposed for a few hours at a time, so we need to develop a really rapid way of recording this archaeology, um, hence the smartphone app. And we're also working uh, with volunteers all along the coast. So we said this morning about working with people, not at people, talking at them and telling them what they want to hear. It's sort of working with people, exploring the heritage that's important to them. Um, a lot of our, vo our volunteers actually flag up um, archaeology that's at risk on the coast. Um, so without them, we wouldn't know anything about this kind of stuff. So, um, so we're creating all this data. What are we going to do with that? We'll tell you in a second. <laughs> So we encourage dissemination of results. So um, rather than just exploring archaeology along your coast and writing all these records down and then putting it in a banker box and putting it in your closet or under your bed, we're encouraging people to publish online and make it available um, for everyone to sort of explore um, and interrogate, and also for that to go into the sort of national and local uh, repositories. So we, took, we promised a maritime whirlwind tour of uh, English coastal heritage. So here we are. This is the kind of stuff people think about for archaeology that we're looking at on the coast. So sort of hulked vessels and wrecks. This is some lovely ones <coughs> down at Hoo Lake in Devon. Um, here's us recording some of those as well. So you start kind of recording typical maritime and uh, sort of marine archaeology. Um, and a marine built heritage, uh, lighthouses and so forth. This is actually an atomic weapons research establishment, which is pretty cool. Uh, I must say. <laughs> so this is actually a sort of bombing target, so we have to be very careful with our health and safety, I should mention, uh, for this project. Um, but we're recording all sorts of different kinds of things. With some of our volunteers down uh, in Suffolk. Also things that are terrestrial that are now in the intertidal zone. So this is um, actually some prehistoric footprints at Formby Merseyside, very well known for its prehistoric footprints. They're incredibly fragile, so again that's why it's very important that we have a tool that can rapidly record these things. Um, so you've got a, a couple lines of them. So you've got some coming down here and some here as well. The preserved and the laminated silts there. Okay, other more fragile things coming up. So lots of timber is preserved um, in this environment. So um, we're trying to act quickly to record these. These actually were lifted um, along with the help of the local archaeologist. And Sarah Poppy was there too. She got to play with us uh, in historic England. Um, so we're, we're sort of finding really exciting new heritage that people aren't seeing. Um, before. Um, and so re recording things that come up in the mud, but also in section, <laughs> which is kind of bizarre. This is actually a 70 meter section. Um, so this is actually in the 80s um, in East Sussex, Belt 2. There's a, a shaft coming through the chalky cliffs there. With You can see the tool, the worked tool marks with actually the foot and hand holds there. It's crazy stuff. We didn't record this. This is from the 80s. But um, as the coastline recedes down there, we were thinking, huh, well, you know what? That shaft is going to hit the ground somewhere. Let's see if we can find the bottom. <laughs> so we mobilized our volunteers down there who were very active, very keen. 
Um, and we figured it was safe enough now not to send them so close to the cliff edge. We, fig we could kind of extrapolate where the um, coastal retreat had happened since then. And lo and behold, in February last year, ta da! <laughs> Um, so excited, wanted to excavate it, wanted to record it quickly, um, got all the permissions in, and it was this deep. <laughs> like, oh, Bronze Age ritual depositions in a well. No, I didn't sign any of that, that stuff, so. Oh well. <laughs> Negative evidence is exciting too, right? So, um, anyway, let's, let's move quickly on. Otherwise, I'll roll over Andy's time. Uh, so I'll quickly talk you through how we're collecting this data. Um, and how we're collecting a wide range of data, because you see that's kind of quite different environments, quite different types of archaeology. So we have this online interactive map that you can go online uh, with your browser, or you can get it on your smartphone. It's all free to download. It works offline. If you've ever been on the coast uh, in England or around the UK, like very difficult, patchy in places to get online. <laughs> so we're going to zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. Around being home and you can click the dot and interrogate it and find out more information about it. So this is a lime kiln, as I mentioned before. Uh, you can click it open with your phone and you get these feature forms. I don't know if this is too small to you guys to read, but I can show you guys later on my phone. Um, and you can record basic information about a feature. This is sort of monument level data. You can feature name, whether it's been located or not, so presence or absence. Um, you get a GPS location on your phone um, and you can take photos with your phone, so it's a perfect recording tool. <coughs> so whiz through, you get a nice description of things. Um, you can take photos up to four, so that kind of limits that like 600 photos of nothing. Um, and a nice little short description for captions and things. Um, record periods, you can also record uncertain. A lot of people aren't really sure if they know what they're looking at, so that's important too. Um, you can justify your thing. And then we also do sort of a condition survey. So. Uh, the state of the tide, whether you can see it or not, high or low, <clears throat> whether it's being eroded, if there's any coastal processes happening to it, or if it's being accreted on top of, so whether it's being covered. Um, and the important thing for us is whether it's visible or not, and that would be important to record whether it's high or low tide as well. So if it's not visible, but also high tide or being accreted on, maybe that's why you can't see it. And the important part here is uh, it doesn't just go live automatically, so you can't just put any garbage you want in there. So uh, we actually look at all the records, we moderate it, we try to cross-reference it um, using Heritage Gateway and other kind of things, so it's not creating lots of duplicate records, hopefully. <laughs> and, uh, and that all goes through, I'll show you quickly. You can actually choose, this is actual record, by the way, by Jane Dixon, one of our super volunteers from Mersey Island. Um, and you can actually select the items on this sort of right-hand column to move in. So if some of it's really good and some of it's not as good, you don't have, it's not all or nothing. It's like that. She said feature instead of structure, structure is more useful. We've kept structure instead of feature, something like that. Um, and this is the sort of event side of things like I already discussed, so we won't really bang on too much about that. Um, and then you can see at the bottom you've got associated features with each sort of moment that they've visited this, this, this event sort of data. So you can then look through all the photos as well and see change over time, hopefully, as you're looking through the photos. And then when it goes live, you get these green dots for new features and yellow dots for sort of legacy or imported data. Um, so then you can compare and sort of see a context for the whole sort of area. <laughs> and maybe then we're hoping you can see either new features because people haven't looked at it before or new features because there's an area of serious erosion happening, potentially. Um, kind of the quick, everyone loves a graph. Uh, this is sort of what we've been up to. Lots of things coming in, um, but they're quite short instances of data. So it's, um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. We've been talking with ADS a lot about data depositions, so we're working on that. <laughs> um, and this is the, the sort of slide if you guys want to have a, have a look. So the idea is that we, cre we gathered this baseline data from all sorts of different sources that um, sort of HERs, National Trusts, for our partners, um, Historic England, et cetera. As mentioned earlier, they do uh, maritime data, marine data. Um, that's our baseline. Then we can update it with our volunteers and ourselves as well. It's quality assured by yours truly. And it um, goes via the ADS back to all the stuff. So it's actually a cyclical thing. It doesn't just go one direction. 
Um, and I think that's me done. So who are these people? That'll be Andy talking about that in a second. Um, there are quite a few of them. Not all of them are creating data, as we will talk about in a second, but I think a lot of people are signing up to use our um, system to sort of explore the data, interrogate it, because they want to know about it. They don't quite want to update them yet, but we'll see. And that's where I stop. So uh, the boss has spoken about why we do it and how we do it. Uh, I'm going to talk about the interesting bit, about the important people, um, our volunteers. Um, we have just over 1,400 volunteers. We have registered users in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, the US and Canada. Um, most of our users are based in the UK. Um, based in England. 80% of our registered users have smartphones, which is good for a project whose primary recording tool is a smartphone app. Um, the remaining 15% or so uh, use the uh, data through a um, de desktop uh, web browser. There are a small percentage, about 4 to 5%, um, who refuse to use the digital apps, don't like the digital data, and so send us stuff in paper form, which we then digitize and put up ourselves. Um, the majority of our users are based in England, um, so they are mainly Brits. We do, however, have uh, Americans, Canadians, um, Poles, South Africans, um, and so on, who said that they were from North London as their nationality. I've never known London to have two nationalities, but there you go. Um, about 300 of our users have given us locational data, so we can start breaking our users down. Um, the majority of people come from and work in the southeast, so about 51% of our users work in the southeast, about 31% work in the southwest, and uh, a teeny tiny portion work up here, which is a bit depressing for me because this is the area that I work in. So 18% of our users work in the north of England. Um, towns with the most registered users, London obviously being the big beast that it is, has the most of our users. Um, it also has the most international users, as you might imagine. Um, that's where your South Africans and your Poles are. Um, most of the northern towns only have two or three users, so don't make it into any of our top five. Um, this is what we weren't expecting. Uh, this is North Wales. Um, we have several users who are working in North Wales, although our data set only covers England. This is a user called Fixer P, um, who, as far as we can figure out, goes on his holidays to the Clean Peninsula and records archaeology on his holidays. There are another two users, though, who are working in North Wales, living in North Wales, and recording archaeology in North Wales. That's quite interesting because they're working in the bit which doesn't have the Arthur Deer project <coughs> running through it. For those people who aren't familiar with Welsh archaeology, the Arthur Deer project is citizen in Wales. Um, so the people who decided they weren't going to do it up around Flint, thanks a lot, um, given us a few headaches, but there you go, never mind. Um, we have 89 active surveyors um, in, in England, which is about 33% of our registered citizen surveyors. These are the people who are actually going out and recording the archaeology. Again, over 50% of those people are in the southeast. 28% uh, are in the southwest, and a teeny tiny proportion, again, is in the north of England. Um, our funding stream comes to an end in this time next year. So our aim for this final part of the project is to convert the 77% of our users who like to use the app as a gazetteer, who like to go out and have a look at the archaeology, but don't like to go out and do any of the active stuff, we're hoping to convert those into active surveyors so that we can create significantly more records, so we can give you lot, lots of data to play with, hopefully, anyway. Um, surprisingly, over 60% of our users are male. Um, we were expecting there to be a more even spread um, across men and women, but the majority of our users are men. Um, the majority of our users are employed as well. Again, we were expecting the majority of our users to be retired, but only 32% are 
our users are retired, and almost 50% of our users are in the age bracket of 46 to 65. Again, we were anticipating that our users were going to be in the 65 plus category. Um, interestingly, 15% of our users claim themselves to be professional archaeologists, so that's great. They're all the spots who do this as a job and then go out on their holidays and record the archaeology on their time off as well, people like me. 24% um, of them record, describe themselves as amateur archaeologists, which is quite nice. So they're people who are dealing with um, archaeology and using it, uh, using our app as a tool to record the archaeology for themselves. Um, we have people who would like to use our app for non maritime archaeology, non-intertidal archaeology. Um, we have to work quite hard to tell people that, yes, it will work on top of mountains, but it's not designed to work on top of mountains. So um, some of our information isn't quite where you would anticipate it to be. Um, but there you go. Uh, I suppose the important thing is that people are um, interested in the archaeology and are interested in using the app to create archaeological sites for people to go and talk about. Um, so we hope in the last year of the project to create significantly more citizen surveyors and to create uh, the citizen surveyors that we have to spread the word and create the over 70% of our passive users into active users. Thank you very much.